thought there was a special. No special. Hey, we're all special tonight. And uh, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ezra and chapter number seven, Ezra and chapter number seven as we continue through the book of Ezra on Sunday evenings. Uh, Ezra and chapter number seven. And when you found your place, if you would be willing to stand with me, please, for the uh, honor of God's word. Beginning, and we're going to start in verse number six, verses one through five is, is the uh, genealogy there of Ezra. And uh, so we're going to begin in verse number six and read down uh, to verse number 10. Ezra chapter number seven, beginning in verse number six. The Bible says, and Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given, and the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And there were some of the children of Israel and of the priests and of the Levites and the singers and the porters and the Nephthims unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgment. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this portion of scripture, Lord, that you might give us wisdom, understanding, uh, Lord, that you might help us see ourselves in the passage, Lord, and that you might uh, help us with what you would have for us tonight. Lord, we don't want to just simply be hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word. And Lord, that you might confront us uh, with the truth as we would need to be confronted. And Lord, that you might comfort us with the truth as we would need to be comforted. And Lord, that you would help us this evening that would be different because of the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, just, just in reference to where we are, just to remind ourselves where we are, the children of Israel were in captivity in Babylon because of sin. Can I just tell you this? Sin will lead to captivity, okay? Sin will lead to captivity, it happens every single time. Uh, Paul says, I have to bring my every thought into captivity. What, why? Because if I don't, my flesh will lead me into its own captivity. So I have to make sure I guard myself and, and die daily because sin will lead to captivity. Sin had led to the judgment of God being rested upon the children of Israel. Just like the Bible would tell us in the book of Hebrews that the chastisement of the Lord would rest upon the believer. Do you think chastisement rests upon the believer because of obedience or disobedience? Well, certainly not because of obedience. And sin will lead to captivity. The, can I help you with this? It wasn't, even, it wasn't just their sin. It was also the sin of others. Do you know your life can be turned upside down because of the sin of others? Okay. And it can lead to, to difficulty in life and heartache in life, not just because of your sin, but because also the sin of others. And so they were in captivity 70 years, and God began to stir them up. Aren't you glad that God doesn't forget you in captivity? And he will constantly uh, remind you. He will constantly make you aware. And uh, I told the story of my brother who, who got out into sin and started to live in the world. He said, the one thing that I knew that God was calling me back God was calling me back, and there was rebellion, and there was stubbornness, but when that day came of surrender, guess who was still waiting for the prodigal? It was the father at the door was still waiting. So they were in captivity. God, through Cyrus, gives the decree, you can go back up to Jerusalem. So here's Jerusalem, which in the Old Testament, that city, and for us, by illustration, it represents our life. Okay? And in Jerusalem, this place of peace and the presence of God that has been destroyed by sin, it's in rubble and it is in ruin, they come back. And before their life gets perfect, they begin to worship God. Aren't you glad you don't have to wait for your life to get perfect to worship God? Don't wait for your life to get perfect before you worship God. Okay? Because your life will never be perfect until you see him. And so they begin to worship God, and God instructs them first and foremost to build the temple. The temple, the heart of the city, the place where the presence of God will reside. That's what he asked them to build first. Just like when David was in sin, and he said, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Okay, restore unto me the joy of my, thy salvation. 
So when we are in captivity, whether it's a long tap captivity or to be honest with you, uh, do you know how much good resides in your flesh? None. So if you're, in the, if you're walking in the flesh, could we recognize that you're walking in captivity? Okay, you don't have to be in captivity. He's given you freedom from that captivity, but as soon as you set aside the spirit and you begin to walk in for flesh, what is the end result? You will fulfill the lust of the flesh. So therefore, God calls you back. The problem is, when I come back, sometimes the result of my sin is damage. The result of my sin is rubble. The result of my anger is hurt feelings. The result of my bad choices are bad consequences. And so you come back, but things were not the same as when they left. Zerubbabel, who comes back, the city is broken down. It did not have the beauty it once had. It did not have the temple that it once had. There was ramifications for sin. And man, can I just remind you of that? Uh, there are ramifications, there are consequences for sin. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. And so here they are coming back, and, and now God begins to tell them to build the heart first. Don't build the walls of the city yet. Don't try to look impressive to, your, to your, the people around you. Don't try to do, build the heart first. And man, we've been talking about that week after week after week through Ezra. Build the heart first. First, well, you know what happened in chapter number six? The temple got finished, okay? The, the temple was finished, the dedication took place, and so the building that God had asked took place, and God would ask us the same, to build the heart first. You say, well, preacher, uh, our heart's never gonna be completed. Hey, can I tell you, neither was the work on the temple yet done. There was more work gonna be done, but the presence of God was able to move in because there was surrender, there was dedication, there was consecration. So when God begins to build your heart, ultimately what he's looking for is surrender. He's looking for surrender. When you surrender, first in salvation and then in willingness to obey God, when you surrender and give him the throne of your heart, as he says in Revelation to, to the church, behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man open the door, I will come in unto him, and I will sup with him and he with me. So uh, understand this thinking, that God does not conquer hearts. God looks for his hearts to be surrendered. Do you think God could have knocked down the door of the church that he was knocking outside of? Oh, well, you bet he could have. You think God could have forced his way in? Well, certainly he could have. But you know what he does? He stands at the door and knocks. He stands at the door and knocks. And so he's looking for surrender. Well, now the temple is done. There has been surrender. There has been consecration. Can I, can I tell you this? It seems sometimes that 90% of the work that is done in church is, please surrender. Please surrender. Please surrender. We take our kids to camp, and you know what we ask them to do? Please surrender. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. On Friday, they go, okay, I'll surrender. Anyway, okay, well, next year when you come back to camp, we'll ask you to surrender again. And that's what we do a lot in church. Please surrender. Please surrender. And finally, we might say, okay, God, I surrender. You, know what, you understand what surrender means? It means to give up control. It means to... Give God a blank sheet of paper and say, okay, my life, you fill in. It means you instruct, you teach, you guide, you determine. I surrender. Think about some of the surrenders in history that have taken place and, and some of those things, that, some of those battles that have taken place. If you surrender the battle, you don't have much power at the negotiating table. As you're surrounded by the enemy, they overtake you and you surrender. And then you go, okay, now here's how I'm going to ask you to rule over me. Here's the, here's the terms that I give you in order to be the victor and to command my life. No, 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 you surrendered. So if you surrendered, therefore, the victor, the one who has control, can determine now how you live your life. You're like, I don't like the sound of somebody else determining how I live my life. 
Well, if it was me determining how you lived your life, I would be scared. If it was you determining how I live my life, I would be scared. But can I tell you who the determiner is? It's God through his word that determines how we live our life. So here we have in Jerusalem, the temple has been built. The consecration, the dedication, the surrender has been made. The presence of God has moved in. There's been a declaration of dependency upon God. There is a necessity of dependency because the, the, the walls are still in ruin and, and the walls are still broken down. And so they declare, we surrender. So what does God do? God sends a man named Ezra. And it tells us about Ezra, and look what it says in verse number six. Then Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. Now, here's what's gonna happen. This is why there's such a struggle with surrender. As I, as I told a young man one time that he told me, he goes, preacher, he says, he goes, I, I, I want to live, live for God, but I feel like I'm just a little bit rebellious and I'm okay with that. I said, well, isn't that nice that you're okay with it? I said, is God okay with it? Well, no. And he said, well, what do I do? I said, here's what you do. Take a blank sheet of paper. Walk into your preacher's office, because that's the person that God has placed in your life at this point, right? To help you along the way. And put that blank sheet of paper in, on your, in front of your pastor and say, if you can show me from the Bible where I should do it, I'll do it. If you can show me from the Bible where I shouldn't do it, I won't. He said, I don't know if I can do that. I said, well, then you haven't surrendered. Okay, okay. And he was trying to coax himself into doing it. That's not surrender. Okay, right? that's negotiation. And you can see the wheels running in his head. Okay, as long as I make a few things non-negotiable, uh, that's not a blank sheet of paper. Okay, surrender is waving the white flag flag. And so surrender has been made, consecration has been made, and so God will send Ezra in, and he will send Ezra. And why does he send Ezra? Because the Bible says he is a ready scribe. He is a skilled scribe. He is a prepared scribe. A, a scribe in what area? It tells us in verse number six that he is a ready scribe in the law of Moses. When you surrender, God will immediately begin filling in the blanks. He will immediately begin filling in the blanks of that blank sheet of paper that you put in, of your life. He will immediately begin giving you instructions as the one who has surrendered to the one you have surrendered to. He will immediately begin to put in those things. You're like, wait, preacher, I don't, I don't want God to do that. Well, then you haven't surrendered. We talk about surrender a lot. But the question is, have we really surrendered? Okay? And so they surrendered. God sends the ready scribe, uh, Ezra, and he begins to do a work. And, and I love this. When God sends a work, when God begins to do a work, it is not only included in instruction, it's also included in praise. When's the last time somebody conquered, uh, conquered another nation and said, here's what we're going to send you. We're going to send you someone to educate you in, the way, in our ways and somebody to help you sing the joy, a new joyful song. That's not the normal method of conquering. Okay? Normally, when we conquer somebody, we just take all their money. Okay? Turn them into slaves to do our bidding. Okay? Not for their benefit, but for our benefit. Man, what a benevolent, gracious God who when we surrender to him, though he receives glory from our service, can I tell you what it is in our life? It's a good work. He who hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. And so it tells us that in verse number eight, it says, uh, in verse, I'm sorry, in verse number nine, uh, it says this in verse number nine, uh, I lost it, verse number seven, sorry. And so the children of Israel went up and the priests and the Levite and the singers and the porters and the Nephtalims unto Jerusalem in the seventh year. He said, I'm going to send uh, Ezra the scribe who is going to instruct you in the law of the Lord. He's going to instruct you how to proceed from the point of surrender. He said, but it's not all going to be burdensome. I'm also going to sing you the singers, and I'm also going to sing you the porters, and these are the ones who are going to serve you in your surrender, and these are going to the ones who are going to celebrate with you in your surrender. 
Can I tell you, surrender to God is not a grievous thing. Uh, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so when we surrender to God, God will return to us instruction, but God will also return to us service, and God will also return to us praise. Joyous people are surrendered people. Conflicted people are people that have not yet surrendered or, or take back the surrender. You ever take back your surrender? Okay, God, I surrender. God says, okay, I want you to do this. Not anymore, I don't surrender anymore. We struggle with that. Okay, so God will send a man, can I tell you, God will send his word to instruct you as how to proceed from surrender. But to be real honest, as, as I've been praying about this book, this is a critical time because everybody enjoys the story of returning from captivity. Oh man, I was in conflict and I was in consequences over sin and God's grace received me again. Isn't that a good story? Man, I, I was struggling and I was in Babylon and God said, come back to Jerusalem. Man, that's a good story. And that, that, that's a story you might see on a movie, you know, difficulty and pain and trial, but no happy ending, Jerusalem. But movies end at the end of two hours. And something has to happen after you get back to Jerusalem and the temple's built. You know what God says? Instruction in the law of the Lord. What had led to their sin was a deviation from the word of God. In order to not return back to captivity, there must be a renewing and a re-education and instructions in God's word. But that requires continual surrender. See, when we get captured by somebody, when, I, when one nation gets captured by another and they go, they look around and they say, what do I do? I have nothing else to do. I may as well surrender. They don't surrender based upon the terms. They surrender based upon their weakness. They, they surrender based upon their inability to, to succeed. Well, when I compare myself to God, that's where I find myself. I am not able. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I have no ability in of myself. So therefore, I surrender. So the terms ultimately are God's. Uh, how he would dictate that surrender. How he would instruct beyond that surrender. Okay, conquered person. Okay, surrendered person, I should say. Here's how you are now going to live. Ezra gives us an example, and then he will carry out that example in the nation of Israel. As he instructs them in the way and as he deals with sin over the next couple of chapters. Look what it tells us as he gives us this example. He arrives, he comes to Jerusalem, and it tells us this in verse number uh, 9, because the good hand of his God was upon him. And it says in verse number 10, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel the statutes and judgment. And so Ezra is not going to ask the children of Israel to do something that he first has not done himself. And it's very important for us to understand that immediately following surrender, there needs to be instruction. And that instruction must be met by obedience. Okay, let me ask you a question. When you got saved, when you put your faith and trust in Christ, it was not a work, it was an act of faith. I am a sinner, I need a savior, he died for me, I believe that he died and was buried and rose again, he can wash away my sin by the blood that is shed upon the cross, I put my faith and trust in what God has done for me. Praise the Lord, you were in captivity of sin, but he brought you out of captivity, that's salvation. What's the very next thing God says to do? Get baptized. You know what baptism is? Baptism is terms of the surrender. You're telling everybody out there that you have surrendered to him. It is a declaration of a good conscience. As you express, it is an act of obedience and recognition to the dependence and surrender that has been placed upon God in terms of salvation. God is looking for that act of obedience to take place. He's looking for uh, when we put our faith and trust in Christ to respond in obedience to get baptized. Can I tell you, there's lots of reasons not to get baptized. Lots of reasons not to get baptized. But if we take any of those reasons, you know what we're saying? 
There was no surrender. There was a lack of surrender. And we understand that as believers who have been saved and been baptized. We're thinking, man, I, of course I want to get baptized. That's an act of obedience to God. God continues the instructions that he fills in the blanks. This is what God is looking for. He's looking for intentionality, willing obedience. Do you remember the story in the Old Testament of the young king, Josiah? He was eight years old. The Bible says he was eight years old and he walked in the ways of David, his father, and turned either to the left or the right. But he obeyed. He surrendered his life and his kingdom to God. There was willing obedience. Do you know what sprung out of willing obedience? A desire to know the Lord. The Bible says in the eighth year of his reign, Josiah began to seek after the Lord his God. We go, man, I just want to know God better. I just want to know God better. Well, first and foremost, you need to adhere, adhere to the terms of surrender. You need to prepare yourself to seek after the Lord God. That preparation comes from willing obedience. Why do you think God wants some, a new believer to identify with Christ in baptism? It is willing obedience. Now, let's put it in terms of parent and children. Parents, you want obedience. Can I say you will demand obedience. You will get obedience. But there's a difference between forced obedience and willing obedience. When you tell your son to go out and mow the yard, and he's like, Dad, I want to go mow the yard. Don't make me go mow the yard. Grumble, grumble. Guess what ends up happening? He's going to mow the yard. I just... He's going to mow the yard. But when he mows the yard, it's not like you go, man, that's my son. I forced him to mow the yard. What a blessing. I mean, I had to stand at the window and watch him because he quit three times. Man, I'm so proud. Okay? That doesn't build relationships. Okay? That builds rebellion. Even the very act, you know what the Bible says? Rebuke a scorner and he will hate thee. And so as you are uh, producing that child-parent relationship, you know what you're really looking for to know that you have the heart of your child? You're looking for willing obedience. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for, they may not understand it, they may not get it, they may not even want to do it, but you are dad and I am child, so therefore, based upon the relationship, I will do it. Man, when you get that, that's what you have, willing obedience, and that builds a relationship instead of stretches a relationship and fractures a relationship. You ever hear somebody say, hey, don't be too strict on your children or you'll push them away, okay? Now, I understand why they say that. I understand why they say that. But can I tell you what pushes away? It's less the rules that you're asking them to do and more the unwilling heart of them to do it. It's two sides of a coin there. You, and what is too strict? I want you to clean up your room. Oh, that's way too strict. You know what you're looking for? Willing obedience. Just like a parent who is looking for that willing obedience that will mold and build a relationship, in order for us to go from surrender to righteousness and service, the first step God is looking for is willing obedience. Willing obedience is dictated or, or, or described by a preparation, by an anticipation, okay? The Bible tells us here in our passage that Ezra prepared his heart to seek the Lord. That meant his obedience was not reactive. His obedience was proactive. He prepared his heart to seek the Lord. Uh, the Bible often will term it like this, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40, wait on the Lord. Uh, Hosea chapter 12, wait on the Lord. That is that prepared anticipation. Okay, God, what's next? Okay, God, what's next? I remember when years ago when I was coaching and I was coaching baseball, you could see there were some uh, kids that were totally engaged. They loved the game and they loved to learn and they would have that anticipation. They thought I had something to teach them, and so they're like, okay, what next? What should I do next? 
And I would say, you know what? Pitchers, they really need to learn to, to build up their arms, and that best way for them to do that is to run. So while we do this next exercise with them, you guys go and run a couple laps. And there was two attitudes. Oh, you're kidding me. I got to go run. <laughs> Forced obedience. And the other kid go, okay, all right, so this is going to help me? Yes, this is going to help build up your run. Okay, I'm going to go run. Willing obedience. In order for us to be able to be in a place where we can seek after the Lord, you know what the Lord's looking for? <clears throat> Willing obedience, which is described by a preparation to seek after the Lord God. I, I may have used this before, but what would you think of the preacher that came into the service and said, okay, let's see, tonight we're going to preach on 1 Samuel chapter 10. All right, we are ready to go. Um, David did a bunch of good stuff. Right, you think, man, I, give you, I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for a, a preacher who had not prepared to preach a message. Right? And that's easy to say about the preacher, but what about the people that have not prepared to hear the message? Yeah, but it's just church. So why are you here? <laughs> Well, you know, if I don't come, somebody's going to say something, or you and my wife, you know, i got to be a good example to the kids. Those are not reasons to come to church. Here's why we come to church. Okay, okay, what's next? What's next? I've surrendered. God will instruct, and I know what he has for me is the very best thing. So here's my blank sheet of paper. Fill it in, God. Fill it in. And when there is willing obedience it will produce an avenue where you can seek after the Lord God and that will produce in you a desire to know him more. How, how do I get a desire to know the Lord more? Well, first of all, you got to surrender. After the surrender, you say, okay, Lord, I surrender, willing. Tell me what to do. And as you willing obey, willingly obey him, the activity that he has you do will produce a desire in you to know him more. Uh, let's go back to the baseball practice the kid that's like, what next? Another drill? Ugh. But the kid that has the anticipation to know what's next, and I tell him, hey, this is going to work. This is going to work. This is going to work. I remember working with a kid that he had never hit the ball in his life. I say kid. I was coaching high school. He had never hit the ball in his life, and his swing was like a circle. Woo. And I told him, listen, it's not going to work. And he wanted to hit the ball so bad. So we worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. I said, you do this, you'll hit the ball. You do this, you'll hit the ball. Hey, wouldn't you know it? He got in the game. He did it. Just the, the skills and the uh, procedures and the basics that he was taught, guess what happened? He hit the ball. He had never hit the ball before. It made it about three feet past the pitcher's mound. <laughs> he was so excited. He was a big kid. He just couldn't swing right. He hit the pass to the pitcher's mound. He was so excited. He's like, man, that was awesome. I hit the ball. You know what his attitude was? Okay, now what? What next? That obedience, which produced success, created desire so that he would be able to succeed more and do more. If we would understand that in, 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 a, in a silly physical illustration or a work illustration, how much more when Ezra prepares his heart to seek after the Lord as God and God responds to him and that obedience produces desire, Josiah, he said, I will obey. Not going to turn to the left, not going to turn to the right. And he walks in obedience and it produces a desire to know his God. Man, we lack that. We lack a desire to know God. And so we go, okay, I'm going to have a desire to know God. I'm going to have a desire. How do you create desire? You create your desire by operating in obedience to God's word. And as the hand of God is upon you, and as the blessings of God fall upon you, it produces a desire to know him more. We want to go like this. I am the perfect Christian. Yeah, let me know how that works for you. Especially since we were just in captivity not too long ago. Right? So I prepare, I wait, 
I anticipate. It doesn't matter how big the task or more likely how small the task. I respond in obedience. I respond in obedience. You've heard the story of the missionary. I know you've heard the story where the missionary would play this game with his kids. He was a missionary in, uh, in Africa. And he'd play this game with his kids. And he said, kids, whenever I tell you to stop and stand still, I want you to do that. And they would play this game. Stop. Freeze. And the kids would freeze. Simple game of obedience. And the missionary was looking outside one day and the, and the kid was playing under a tree and there was a large snake that was right above him getting ready to strike and the missionary said, stop, freeze. And the young man froze, stood there still and saved his life when the dad came and took care of the snake. Imagine if the young man had not obeyed with simple, willing obedience. Man, you know what that young man's heart must have been when dad pulled him away and showed him that large dead snake on the ground? Oh, dad, thank you so much. You know, I, I couldn't have done it without your obedience. I couldn't have done it without your obedience. Do you understand that God, though he will complete his work in you, it may be by fire. Can I tell you, God works with those that are obedient. James chapter 4. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Well, how does that process work if you don't cleanse your hands? Uh, just, it's okay. Keep your hands, ye sinners, draw nigh unto God, and he will resist you. You know what that drawing nigh of God is? Based upon obedience. Cleanse your hands. So it tells us in a passage that he prepared, uh, I lost my place, I'm in 1 Samuel. Uh, he prepared to seek his heart after the law, uh, seek after, prepared his heart to seek after the law of the Lord. And look what the Bible says in verse number 10. And to do it. So there's that preparation of, okay, what next? What next? What is God going to ask me to do? What thing is God going to require of me? And he prepared his heart. I want to know it because I desire to know God. And knowing God is going to come through the avenue of, of obedience. Don't get me wrong. God's going to build the heart first, but after he builds the heart, he's looking for surrender, and that surrender is going to be demonstrated by obedience. And as I begin to obey him, it produces a desire in my heart not only to know the law of the Lord, but to do the law of the Lord. Hey, this is why we talk about Christians struggling, 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 struggling. Can I tell you, God is not planning for you to have a life that is not a victory. He wants you to have a life of victory. Well, you mean that's a life without struggle? No, no, no. It's a life without defeat. I mean, victory doesn't imply a lack of struggle. How can you have a victory without struggle? But it implies a lack of defeat. How do I, oh man, preacher, I struggle with the same thing and I struggle with the same thing and I struggle with the same thing. Well, friend, start with obedience. Start with obedience. I know, but it's so hard. Okay, start with obedience. Yeah, but I just, here's what the problem is. The problem is not an inability of obedience. The problem is an attempt to serve two masters. There is a competition for your love. And the reason that we sometimes run back to our captivity is not because we have a physical inability to, 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 uh, to not do it. We have a love for it. We have not surrendered it. And there's a lack of obedience. He said, I prepared my heart to, the, to, to hear and prepare to, under the law of the Lord and to do it. Then it says this in, in verse, it says, and to do it and to teach. Man, you want to talk about having a heart that's built and a life that's surrendered? Here's how you know that you're, you're getting to the, you're progressing forward. God's dealing with me, looking for obedience, looking for surrender. When I give surrender that is followed by obedience that creates a desire, guess what happens? It goes from being about me to being about you. It goes from being about my struggle to being about somebody else's struggle. And when you begin to have the mind of Christ 
and you begin to have the heart of God, it's so much less about you and so much more about everybody else. But man, we have bought a lot of psychiatrists, a lot of Mercedes Benz talking about our own struggles. And I don't want to take away from any people or any vice. I'm not a doctor, but I'll tell you this. If you haven't surrendered, no wonder you struggle. If you haven't responded in obedience, no wonder there's failure. If that willing obedience doesn't produce desire, no wonder you desire other things. And God gives us the example of Ezra. He prepared in his heart. Catch this. He was already a skilled scribe. You know the best way for you to get a love of God's word is to get to know God's word. I'm telling you, as I preach God's word, as I preach through books, I'll come up on section and go, oh, I know that part. And then I'll study it and prepare it to preach and I thought, I did not know it at all. I, man, there's so much more there. It's so much more in, enjoyable when you are investing in. Years ago, we had a, a birthday thing, and the, the church I was at was a blessing to us, and they sent us down to the Rays because they were playing the Dodgers, and I'm a Dodgers fan. So two separate games they sent us to, and so we're over in St. Pete, and, and I took my wife because that's the right thing to do, and, and I took my wife, and we went to the Dodgers game, and I'm sitting in the game like this. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, did you see that? No, I didn't see that. She's sitting at the game like this. Well, this is pretty. Comfortable in here. It's nice. You want to get something to eat? How come it wasn't so intense for her? She's not invested. She's not invested in baseball. Man, I, I, I can watch... Every little thing. And I'll, see, I'll look over at her and say, man, did you see that? Did you see that curveball? Curveball? What are you talking about, curveball? Oh, man, double, pl double play. That was awesome. Uh, six, four, three, double play. Six, six, four, three, what are you talking about? You know why I can enjoy the game so much? Well, I have knowledge of the game. If you don't have knowledge of game, it's difficult to enjoy it. A couple years ago, I said, man, my kids are going to, my boys are going to watch football. And we sat down and started watching football, and they're like, what's going on? Man, I failed. <laughs> what do you mean, what's going on? They, we, we had to teach them. Now that they're learning stuff, there's a little bit of investment. They enjoy it a lot more. You know why some people don't enjoy church? They come to church, and they'll listen to a message like this, and they'll be like, what in the world are you talking about? Now, Aren't you glad God will take you where you're at and move you where he wants you to be? But if there's not that preparation, if there's not that willingness, if there's not the surrender, then we, we operate like the children of Israel on the other side of the Jordan, just going in circles, just going in circles. Uh, they're giants, they're too big, I can't do that. They're giants, they're too big, I can't do that. And God would have us live a life of victory you know, there were a lot of battles on the other side of Jordan, but it was supposed to be a place of victory. It's not void of struggle, but it's the opportunity of defeat, lack of defeat. It's the opportunity of victory. And so he would teach it. It became less about him and more about them. Verse number 10, look what it says. It says this, to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. This is very interesting. He's not going to teach them dimensions of the temple. He's not going to over and over and over again teach them build the temple, build the temple, build the temple, build the temple. The temple's done. Now God says, let's get to business putting a framework on the city. Let's get to business telling you how to operate in my presence, around my presence. The temple is where the presence of God resided. Well, preacher, I'm saved. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. This is where I surrender. I have willing obedience. You know what God's gonna start giving you? Statutes and judgments. Statutes and judgments. And he's gonna start changing your very appetites. 
He's going to start changing your appetites. And that old song, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore, that's going to become real to you. But believe it or not, you could sing it last year, and you probably should be able to sing it this year, and you probably should sing it next year and the next year. Because there's supposed to be that growth and those judgments. I'll give you an illustration. I, when, my, when I first came down to college, I had one purpose in life besides college. No, this was my one purpose in life. Play baseball and go to the beach. That was my purpose in life. I, I wanted to play uh, beach volleyball on the, on the weekdays and baseball on the weekends. Man, that was my purpose in life. Man, and I thought, you know, this is beautiful. Love to come to Florida, and this is awesome. As God began to do a work in my heart, beginning with surrender, God began to change some things in my life. He began to change the way I viewed things. He began to change the way I looked at things. Now I look completely different at going to the beach. If we went to the beach together, I'd be like, oh my goodness, all these people were in their underwear. <laughs> Why are they doing this? I mean, they'd never go to work on Monday like that, would they? Add a little sand, add a little water, you can wear whatever you want. Man, it, it just... Now, if you would have known me back here, I would have thought, what's the big deal? Surrender, obedience... God has changed my outlook. God has changed my view of things. You say, are you, are you getting nitpicky? Now you're meddling. No, no, I'm just giving you a judgment. This is my judgment. People should not see each other in their underwear. I mean, if that's a bad judgment, you let me know later, because I think that's a pretty good one. That's a judgment. Where did I get that from? Can I tell you, that's not what my faith is based upon. We will be the church of... People not seeing each other in their underwear. This is, this is the, what we stand for. No, no, no. First, surrender. Obey God. Seek his word. Willing obedience. Seek to be close to him. And God will begin to give you statutes and judgments. Hey, list them out. Go ahead and list them out. We have a judgment. In our house, we don't watch a movie without looking it up first to see what's in it. We don't want to be caught by surprise. That's a judgment. Where do you get that from? Well, I know what our tendency is. I know our ability to be weak, and so we want to prepare ourselves to seek after the Lord. God is not going to simply leave you fat and happy after he builds your temple. Once he gets a hold of your temple, your heart, he's now going to begin to lay out your life. And how he wants you to live it. And there's a lot of Christians, to be honest, that go, oh, I don't know if I want God to be in charge. I mean, he might ask me to do something I don't want to do. Well, then there's been no surrender. Surrender implies willingness to obey. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, that you would do a work in our heart that we would begin to see you as Lord, as the one who has the right to rule, the one who has the right to determine. Lord, help us put it in its proper place. We do not begin to apply those statutes and uh, begin to, to have all these things prior to the presence of the Lord. We let you build our heart. We let you uh, allow us to have your presence into our life. We, we declare our surrender and then we let you begin to instruct us in the ways of God and in the ways of your word and, and, and those things that we should do and those things that we should not do. You begin to structure a life that will allow your presence to remain, that will allow you to stay as the Lord of our life. Lord, we're so thankful that we know you as Savior. Lord, may we recognize you as Lord. And you have the right to determine how we live our life. But that will only be successful if we are willing to surrender. Help us in Jesus' name.
Amen. Stand together.